Chagrin syndrome is a systemic autoimmune disease. The major target in Chagrin syndrome are exocrine glands, as salivary glands and lacrimal glands. If they do not work, sicker symptoms develop. But also, Chagrin syndrome causes formation of autoimmune complexes, which are responsible for systemic symptoms. So let's discuss the pathogenesis of Chagrin syndrome. Let's take salivary gland. Salivary gland consists of epithelial cells. Epithelial cells on their surface have a specific transporter called aquaporin-5. This transporter provides massive fluid secretion into the oral cavity. But sometimes viruses or smoking can cause severe damage to epithelial cell. As a result, epithelial cell dies by apoptosis. Apoptosis results in formation of autoantigen-containing vesicles. Tissue macrophages consume them and then present some parts of the vesicles on MHC2 receptor to T helper. The logic is that antigen-presenting cell want to know, is apoptotic debris normal material or is something pathogenic? T helpers scan vesicle and in normal condition, T helper recognize such vesicle as a normal substance, and thereby they do not trigger inflammation. But some people have MHC2 receptors that are produced based on HLA DRB1 03 alls, and in this case, most probably, inflammation will develop. And to understand why, we have to know how antigen presentation occurs. In normal condition, when autoantigen-containing vesicles are produced, macrophage intakes vesicle in order to present this vesicle to the helper. And antigen presentation occurs by MHC2 receptor. What we have to know about MHC2 receptor is that it's a protein. And the genetic information that tells us how to make MHC2 receptor is contained in the gene that is located on chromosome 6 and we call this gene HLA-DRB1 gene. But we have different variations of HLA-DRB1 genes, and such variations we call alls. The simplest analogy is the eye color. You see, we all have genes that encodes the color of our eyes. But some of us have blue eyes and some of us have black eyes. And in this case, genes that encodes blue eyes we call blue owl, and genes that encodes black eyes we call black owl. So we all have genes that encodes eye color, but this gene can be different, and different variations which are blue and black colors of the same gene that in this case encodes eyes we call owls. So in case of Chagrin syndrome we all have genes that encodes MHC2 receptor, we call this gene HLA-DRB1, but this gene can be different and different variations of HLA-DRB1 gene we call HLA-DRB1 allos. For example, if person has HLA-DRB1-01 allo, this person will have MHC2 receptor that was made based on genetic information in HLA-DRB1-01 allo, and such MHC2 receptor presents vesicle in a perfectly normal way. And when T helpers income to this receptor, they recognize this vesicle as a normal substance, and because of this, they do not see any danger. If person has HLA-DRB1-07 allele, this person will have MHC2 receptor that was made based on genetic information in HLA-DRB1-07 allele, and such MHC2 receptor presents vesicle also in a perfectly normal way. Thereby, there will be no inflammatory response. If person has HLA-DRB1-04 allel, this person will have MHC2 receptor that was made based on genetic information in HLA-DRB1-04 allel, and such MHC2 receptor also presents vesicle in a normal way, so there will be no inflammatory response. But some individuals have HLA-DRB1-03 allel, thereby in this case person will have MHC2 receptor that was made based on genetic information in HLA-DRB1-03 allele. The problem is that this particular MHC2 receptor do not know how to present vesicles to T-helpers. 
When T helpers income to a mate C2 receptor, in this case, because this vesicle is presented in abnormal way, they cannot recognize vesicle, and thereby they think that it's antigen. In response to any antigen, T helpers immediately becomes activated, and subsequently they activate B lymphocytes that begin to produce antibodies, and also they activate T killers. So in individuals that have HLA DRB1 03 all, MHC2 receptor presents vesicle in abnormal way, and because of this, T helpers recognize autoantigen containing vesicle as antigen. And in response to antigen, T helpers becomes activated. Once T helper becomes activated, T helper, by production of interleukin 6, activate B lymphocytes. If B lymphocytes become activated, they begin to produce antibodies. First of all, they begin to produce anti -row antibodies, and also they produce anti -law antibodies. Antibodies cause severe direct injury to epithelial cells that results in their destruction. Also, T helpers, by production of interleukin 6, stimulate T killers. And in activated state, T killers massively infiltrate epithelial cells. Their infiltration causes severe damage to epithelial cells that also cause their destruction. The lower is the amount of epithelial cells, the lower is the secretion of fluid by salivary gland, and this will cause dry mouth. Also, such strong activation of B lymphocytes inhibits their apoptosis and overstimulate their proliferation. As a result, in long-term perspective, non-Hodgkin lymphoma can be formed. Usually, it's maltoma of affected gland, for example, malt lymphoma of salivary gland. So, Chagrin syndrome is characterized by production of two major antibodies. It's Chagrin syndrome-related antigen A antibodies, we also call them anti rho antibodies, and antigen B antibodies, we also call them anti la antibodies. Patients with Chagrin syndrome have increased risk of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And also, Chagrin syndrome can develop by itself, we call this primary Chagrin syndrome, or it can be secondary Chagrin syndrome due to another autoimmune disorder, as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. So, in Chagrin syndrome, we have two major pathogenic components. It's autoantibodies and activated T-killers. First of all, autoantibodies, together with T killers, can cause direct damage to salivary glands and lacrimal glands. This causes decrease in their secretion. In eyes, damage to lacrimal glands can cause dry eyes, or we call this condition keratoconjunctivitis sicca. And the major problem is that decrease in corneal lubrication causes corneal damage that can significantly affect vision. In skin, decrease in sweat gland secretion cause dry skin, or we call this condition xerosis. In oral cavity, damage to salivary glands cause dry mouth, or we call this condition xerostomia. First of all, xerostomia significantly increases the risk of dental caries. And also, as a compensatory reaction, it causes hypertrophy of salivary glands. The problem with autoantibodies is that they have a rheumatoid factor activity. Means that immunoglobulin M antibodies can bind to FC portion of immunoglobulin G antibodies with formation of immune complexes. Immune complexes are highly reactive substances, and immune complexes are responsible for systemic symptoms. First of all, immune complexes are proteins and increase in proteins concentration cause increase in blood viscosity. Also, these complexes can precipitate in the small vessels. All this combined can cause occlusion of the small vessels of the digits, which can trigger Raynaud phenomenon. The first step in the Raynaud phenomenon is vasoconstriction or occlusion of arterioles. This causes decrease in blood flow into the digits, as a result, ischemia develops and digits becomes white. The second step is prolonged ischemia cause cyanosis of fingers and they become blue. And the third step occurs after the constriction is gone. So now blood flow is restored and income of arterial blood cause redness. 
the position of immune complexes in the blood vessel wall can provoke vasculitis, and most commonly vasculitis manifests with purpura. The position of immune complexes in the synovium can cause inflammation of the synovium that cause arthritis, and arthritis most commonly manifests with arteral gears. The position of immune complexes in the CNS can cause CNS vasculitis, or immune complexes can deposit in peripheral nervous system, which can cause multineuritis. The position of immune complexes on glomerular membrane in the kidney can cause glomerular nephritis, or it can cause direct tubular damage. Also, immune complexes can deposit in the bone marrow, where they disrupt normal production of blood cells. As a result, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, or erythropenia can develop. The position of immune complexes in the heart conduction system can cause heart block, which manifests as arrhythmia. Also, antibodies can bind to red blood cells, and in this state they circulate through the bloodstream until they reach spleen, where macrophages destroy them. As a result, hemolytic anemia develops, which can cause decrease in red blood cells and increase in bilirubin. In clinical medicine, to make a diagnosis, we use criteria. The first criteria is focus score more than one. Basically, we determine the severity of inflammation inside the gland. By focus score, we determine how massive is the lymphocytic infiltration of the affected gland. So here we see grade 1, where inflammation is local. Grade 2, where lymphocytic infiltration is more massive and grade 3, where lymphocytic infiltration is very, very severe. So, the higher the lymphocytic infiltration, the higher the grade and the more severe is the inflammation. On this picture, we see local infiltration in grade 1, large infiltration in grade 2, and massive infiltration in grade 3 and 4. So, focus score basically tells us about the severity of inflammation inside the gland. The second criteria is the presence of anti-SSA antibodies, or we call them anti rho antibodies. Basically, it's also a marker of inflammation. The more severe is inflammation, the higher the amount of antibodies. In Sjogren's syndrome, it's anti rho antibodies and anti la antibodies. Exactly anti rho antibodies we use as a criteria of Sjogren's syndrome. The third criteria is Sika ocular staining score, which is a diagnostic method to determine eye injury. More precisely, by Sika staining score, we determine injury of the cornea. The logic is that we apply to the ocular surface fluorosin, which is dye, and fluorosin sticks to the damaged areas. So basically, the higher the intensity of staining, the higher the severity of damage. If area is not affected, there is no staining and the score is zero. But if some damage is present, fluorosin sticks to the local spots and we can see this as staining of mild intensity. If damage is more severe, the area becomes more intensely stained. And if damage is very severe, this will cause very intense coloration. So in first case, it's mild damage in second case, moderate, and in third case, it's a severe coronal injury. On this image, we can compare clear eye field with grade 3 coronal damage. There is obvious difference. The fourth criteria is based on shimmer test, which can determine decrease in TS production. It's an important test because one of the signature features of Chagrin syndrome is damage of lacrimal glands that cause dry eyes. Basically, we measure lacrimal glands production capacity by the amount of tears that they produce in 5 minutes. The more tears are produced, the larger is the discoloration of the strip. For example, in this case, right eye produces 15 mm, left eye 10. So, lacrimal glands in the right eye works better than lacrimal glands in the left eye. And the fifth criteria is based on unstimulated whole salivary flow test. Because, as we know, Chagrin syndrome causes damage to salivary glands that results in xerostomia. So, how to determine xerostomia? The method is very simple. 
simply put the tube in the mouth and measure how much fluid accumulates with time. So, how do we treat Chagrin syndrome? The two major symptoms are oral dryness and ocular dryness. First of all, about oral dryness. According to current guidelines, initially we should measure the severity of xerostomia. Then the first option is non-pharmacological treatment. Only then we use pharmacological stimulation and as a rescue option we use mucolytics, choleretics and electrostimulation. So, as a first line, we use non-pharmacological methods. It's gustatory stimulants as sugar-free candies or xylitol. Also, we can use mechanical stimulants as chewing gum. Only then we can consider pharmacological agents. It's muscarinic agonies, choleretics and mucolytics. Also, we can use electrostimulation to stimulate salivary gland secretion. The second major complaint is ocular dryness. First of all, we measure how much lacrimal glands produce tears. Then, as a first option, we use artificial tears or lubricants. And only then, we use topical corticosteroids and other pharmacological agents. So, initially, as a first option, we do not use drugs, we use artificial tears or lubricants. Only then we can consider topical non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and corticosteroids. If these do not help, we use topical ocular cyclosporin. In addition to topical sea, we can use serum tear drops and as a rescue option, we can use oral muscarinic agonies. Also, we have systemic manifestations of Chagrin syndrome. And for systemic manifestations, we use strong anti-inflammatory agents. For every complication, as we see, we have different approach. But at least, let's explain the mechanism of these drugs. Among anti-inflammatory agents, we have strong non-selective drugs. It's hydroxychloroquine and cyclophosphamide. They act on multiple links and pathogenesis. The first selective agent is rituximab. Rituximab acts on CD20 receptor on B lymphocytes and induces the apoptosis. So it's anti-CD20 antibody. With decreasing amount of B lymphocytes, the production of antibodies decrease, and thereby the severity of damage decrease. The next agent is belimumab. Belimumab binds to buff receptor on B lymphocytes and also induces the apoptosis. This causes decreasing production of autoantibodies, and thereby this causes decreasing severity of injury. The next option is abatacept. Abatacept is co-stimulator inhibitor. Abatacept inhibit activation of T helpers. Without activation of T helpers, activation of B lymphocytes decrease and thereby antibodies related injury decrease. And also activation of T killers becomes impossible and thereby T killers related damage decrease. Glucocorticosteroids induce apoptosis of lymphocytes. And because lymphocytes are the key players in pathogenesis, decreasing amount of lymphocytes can significantly inhibit autoimmune damage of salivary glands. And also, we can use tocilizumab. Tocilizumab inhibits interleukin-6. Without interleukin-6, B lymphocytes cannot be activated. And thereby, this causes decreasing antibodies-related damage. And also, without interleukin-6, Activation of T killers decrease, and this can decrease T killers related damage.